perceptuality in the movement of consciousness is a tendency towards and the capacity for immediate temporal awareness. So it is the awareness within time and space. Actually, it arises together with time and space. But it is immediate. So for perceptuality, all that exists is an immediate past, here and now. Now in the sense of few nanoseconds ago. <laughs> And conceptuality in the movement of consciousness, the tendency towards and the capacity for mediate temporal awareness. Mediate means language mediated temporal awareness. Awareness of time and space, which takes place in time and space, but it is mediated by language. So for conceptuality, you have there and then and the future. So today, we are talking about integration of science and spirituality, and I'm proposing a new possibility of integration. So this is fundamental philosophy of today's session. The path to oneness is not through integration, which presupposes differentiation, but through oneness itself. Therefore, the path to oneness is the path from oneness. Unity is, while union is made, a truly holistic vision and a genuinely holistic paradigm are attained only by coming from unity, oneness, and wholeness. And I'm inviting you to step into that oneness and think and know from there. And true integration of science and spirituality is attained when the experience of scientific inquiry itself becomes a genuine spiritual activity. For many scientists, science is a job. So just like we have jobs, they have jobs. They go to university and they do whatever they do. And oftentimes, Scientists, I don't know how they begin being a scientist, start their career as a scientist, but once you become a scientist, what you do research may not be anything to do with what you're interested. It is where you get the money from, sometimes, or oftentimes. <laughs> <laughs> so, a friend of mine who is a physicist told me he works for DOD, Department of Defense. So when the methods of spiritual and physical sciences are united within a single continuum of undivided cognitive experience. So true integration is in your doing of science. You need to be the whole being, need to be involved in this scientific inquiry. And the spiritual science and the physical science need to be unified in a single continuum of cognitive experience. All of you are there from the beginning to the end. And all of you are there. Whether you're in doing math, physics, or meditating. Whole cognitive continuum that needs to be present. Yes, please. So, <clears throat> having said that, I want to just review the contributions that the first and second enlightenment made to humanity and to our consciousness. And I will begin with the second enlightenment first. <laughs> so, first I read this with you, and then I will elaborate on this. So the first contribution that the, the Age of Reason and Enlightenment, the second enlightenment made to our human consciousness and development of human consciousness is the abandonment of and freedom from presumptive authority in the matter of knowledge. 
inside the awakened recognition of the power of reason within the evolutionary trend of consciousness towards separation or differentiation and conceptualization, this new word, conceptualization. The second contribution is the creation of self-sufficient and self-sustaining scientific method and of the consciousness and paradigm of methodological orientation itself that has a built-in mechanism for identifying and correcting errors and mistakes through the triumvirate of observation, mathematical description, and experimentation. You know, knowledge, knowledge is co-evolutionary with consciousness. So the edifice of knowledge a particular age develops is concordantly expressive of the guiding consciousness of that age. The, the mode of consciousness, the kind of knowledge you have, are in harmony. They go together. And in the whole history of human consciousness, in its evolution, the age of reason actually about 500 years ago, coinciding with the invention of gunpowder, <laughs> new mode of consciousness start to appear, which I call conceptuality-centered consciousness. And I will explain this. It's very important. So, <coughs> So you, you know, geocentric model of the universe, which is the Earth-centered and everything goes around. And the heliocentric uh, centric model, which is the Sun-centered and everything else goes around. Before Copernicus, before conceptuality-centered consciousness came into existence, when humanity was basically perceptuality-centered, they had geocentric model. You see, in perception, it is not possible for you to perceive Earth moving around the sun. As far as you remain in the perceptual level, it appears that <coughs> Earth is stable and everything else is going around. Excuse me. <coughs> So, for perceptuality centered consciousness, concepts are in service of percept. So, geocentric model is a conceptual rationalization or explanation of how it is perceived. So, for perceptuality centered consciousness, reality is accessed through perception and conception are there to explain. And you need to, we need to use our imagination to really get into that mode. And we were, when we were small, we were perceptuality-centered. Conceptuality-centered consciousness. Heliocentric model is a conceptual construct. You can only imagine you can only have an abstraction of this earth moving around the sun. So, for conceptuality-centered consciousness, reality is accessed through concept, conceptualization, through your conceptual imagination. And percept, those perceptions, are in service of validating or falsifying that indirectly approached and accessed reality. 